Pacific. It's uh, my pleasure, pleasure to introduce uh, Dane Bolton. Uh, Dane comes from actually provide some context. I was attending uh, an NSF modular manufacturing workshop where Dane was giving one of the you know, uh, uh, lectures or features of uh, his vision of the future of energy technology. And it's the most inspiring uh, lecture or talk that I've attended the last year at least. Yeah, this guy has come here and present to us. I invite him and thank you very much for actually accepting the invitation to be here. Uh, Dane uh, was, uh, is now with uh, Cyclotron on Road. I think I said that too, with many of you. It's one of these Californian things that uh, invites uh, really bright young people to go there and explore uh, some uh, uh, unique, interesting idea that addresses the energy crisis and uh, environmental issues. Uh, so that, I don't know if I'm going to get it right in the right order, but he has been with the CTI, Program Director at RPI, uh, an interesting stop at uh, MIT, and had some interesting progress uh, uh, with venture capital and his uh, own company. Uh, one of the inspired things, I don't know if I'm still in some of your lines, but at some point he claimed that at RPI he didn't think he can save the world. So he <laughs> he started uh, on something different, which is cyclotron uh, road today. Yeah. Um, let's uh, talk energy, materialization, and a little bit more chemical engineering stuff. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much Thank for you. actually giving me. All right, how many people are here for the free food? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I guess before I start, I, I'd like to start to give you a little context of who I am, um, uh, whether or not you should listen to me, uh, something you should judge, probably after. <laughs> uh, I got into this area that I'm going to talk about, uh, modular chemical processing, um, working at the Department of Energy. I was a program director at the Advanced Research Projects Agency, RPE. I ran about $120 million worth of R&D projects spread all over the U.S., um, nominally $3 to $5 million in size, um, with universities, big companies, small companies. Uh, and one thing that became clear to me very quickly is that the way that we do innovation, uh, particularly in energy and chemicals, is uh, unsustainable uh, and unproductive in the government on the government side, not you'll see why in the talk, and that uh, how we do it now uh, just isn't going to get us very far. And that we need to fundamentally change the way we think about doing innovation. This actually got me uh, interested in more generically in this idea of democratizing technology. How many people have heard of the term of Democratization, technology democratization. Go on, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Feel free, by the way, to ask questions anytime through. Just yell it out. I'll try and respond. Um, so, basically, the modular chemical production uh, was got me introduced to this idea of democratizing technology, and and that's what I'm really going to start with is just this higher level, and then try to dig down towards. Uh, what uh, the modular chemical production. So just to start with, um, I, this is a picture of the Earth at night. Uh, the white, obviously, is where there's lights, um, and the dark is where there's no light. It's also a great proxy for, this is also where the energy consumption, uh, it's a good proxy for who's using it a lot of energy. So like, you can look at the world and see where the energy consumption is. The problem with this picture is when you look at this, this is the world map of population density. Right? And the, very, the brighter red it is, the more dense the population. Now what happens when we put the one over the other? You see uh, they don't match. Where there's the most people, there's uh, the least uh, amount of power being used. And basically, uh, on average, you take uh, the country of Africa, and they use an order of magnitude less power than we do in North America. So there's a disparity in equity 
around the world with regard to energy. Um, and it kind of even goes beyond that. And this, this is only the consumption by individual people or industries also? This is just lights. We're using light as a proxy. So, so uh, I, I, I found this picture maybe three or four years ago. And actually, it, it, it really just it, it struck me. And, and the reason it struck me is when you look at this picture, it's a picture of I, uh, Isaac Macalia. Um, he's from Tanzania. And he's standing on his farm. And he's got perhaps one of the most high-tech devices in the world, high purity materials, electronic circuits. He can call anyone in the world. It's an incredible device, right? And yet, he cannot make fertilizer or add a molecule to fertilize his farm. And that, you know, that, the, the disparity between those things it was it's just astounding when you think about it. And and it got me thinking about this whole chemical production, uh, production in general. And over and over again, I've come back to this picture sort of as a source of in inspiration for this idea of democratizing technology. So what, what do we mean when we talk about democratizing technology? Let's start with kind of some technologies. Let's give some examples of technologies that have democratized the world. The classic one is the Gutenberg Press. Right. The first first reproduction of, of words. Um, if you think about what happened because of the Gutenberg Press, you know, prior to the Gutenberg Press, the world was the Catholic Church. They told you what to believe, how to believe it. Um, you didn't have access to what the Bible actually said to read for yourself. And then you had the Gutenberg Press. And for the first time in, in history, people could look and say, that's not what that says. And it led to ultimately the Protestant Revolution. And, and without it, you would not have had it. And a breaking of essentially a monopoly. Right? And over and over again, you see in the same pattern over every single time. If you go to the automobile, you know, Ford didn't actually invent mass manufacturing or the automobile, but bringing those two concepts of continuous mass manufacturing, he was able to fundamentally change the way we transport ourselves around, uh, around uh, on an individual basis. People talk about the ISO shipping container. You might say, that's a box. How could that be an innovation? In fact, actually, the rise of China would not have happened without that little box. It fundamentally changed the way we ship goods around the world. When you get a t-shirt made from across the globe, it costs a fraction of a cent to ship it to here. It didn't used to be that way. It used to be 30% of the total cost of a product shipped from abroad was wrapped up in shipping. Now, because of modularization of, of shipping containers, you can ship things anywhere in the world for fractions of a cent. The cell phone. And we know in the Arab Spring, entire revolutions are happening because people can text one another. It fundamentally changed the world. It, it democratized. It brought communications to people who didn't have it. And obviously, the computers. So you see in industries, whether it's information or transportation or shipping or communication or computation, over and over again, the same things you see. So what are these defining features? Uh, and power is the little guy, right? It, it's very rare that the incumbent is the guy that leads the innovation. It's always someone new, and it's that it's the actually the individual. It's Isaac in the first slide who can make a call anywhere on a cell phone who is now in power. It's never developed by the incumbent. So the Catholic Church didn't invent the printing press. They had no incentive to. It's very rare that democratizing technology, I mean, if you're the king and you make the rules, why would you have an incentive to change them? Uh, and then, obviously, it dis displaces the incumbent, levels the playing field, leverages the capital of the many. Now, this is a really big thing. It, it, you'll understand why this is so important later. But if you think about it, the purchase power of one guy in Africa is nothing. But the fact that he can purchase it 
means the entire world has an ability to purchase. That means the capital availability for innovation is orders of magnitude. Even the biggest countries, the uh, most powerful of the countries, don't have the purchase power of the entire world. Right? So that is a really important thing in, in, in innovating and democratizing technology. There is also always an element of modular mass production standardization, whether it's the printing press and pressing things over and over and over again, the automobile making it the same, or, or the uh, cell phone. It all, it's all has these aspects of modularization. And then, uh, last, uh, you know, when we, how many people bought a new cell phone in the last year? Third, how many people bought a cell phone in the last five years? Almost everybody. How many people know of a chemical, I mean, how, how often do you think a chemical plant, a new chemical plant is built? Every 20 years. Like that's the average that this. So the relative innovation cycle for your electronic device is two orders in magnitude faster than what's happening in the chemical production industry. Think of that. How can you innovate when things take that long? So and here are just a lot of so again, other examples. And think, people think about guns. <laughs> it's a negative, but in fact, guns were a very important democratizing technology that allowed, um, it actually, ultimately allowed for the downfall of the noble, right? Like you could raise an army uh, and not need to hire mercenaries that were skilled in the art of war. Full voltaics. People think, you know, actually solar thermal technology is just as good, if not better, than solar voltaic PVs. But PV is modular. PV can access the capital demand. Thermal solar, you need a big system, lots of capital, high upfront cost. Not many people could get there. So what about energy tech? Um, how many people in the room are in chemical engineers? Uh, how many people were taught scale up six tenths law or two thirds? The bigger it gets, the less costly. How many people teach that? Professors teach that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what's going on. All right, so this is the way energy technology looks like today. You want to build a coal power plant? You need one to ten billion dollars. Okay. Hope you have that lying around. How about an ammonia plant? You want to build an ammonia plant? Half a billion to five billion dollars. Um, how about let's do something more innovative? Let's let's make a gas to liquids plant like they have in 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 um, Qatar. About five to fifty billion. It's a lot of money. Okay. I hope you have it. So why do we go big? This is the, the, the famous the famous economies of unit scale. You've seen it over and over again, two-thirds scale law. And I plotted actual real data for gas to liquid plants. But you could do this for any technology. And, and you know, basically what it says is the bigger it gets, um, the lower cost of whatever you're producing, dollar per barrel per day in this case. Uh, this could be dollar per kilowatt. Um, it really doesn't matter. Bigger means more cost effective. Except for that you start to see that it starts to diverge when you get to really, really big scales. So here's the argument you always hear. It's the classic argument. How many mechanical engineers? Only one. OK, this is a shout out to mechanical engineers. You know what a hoop stress is? Yeah. OK. How many chemical engineers know what a hoop stress is? OK, see? So the problem, this is the standard argument, chemical engineering. The bigger it gets, the more money you make because the profit goes up by the volume. And what you pay for is the, because, you know, and a chemical engineer of the world is a pipe. Right? That pipe says that the bigger it gets, the smaller, the, 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 the less area you need. The problem with that is that chemical engineers aren't mechanical, they don't know about hoop stress, right? The reality is the bigger, the scaling law for the cost of materials is actually a constant. And so the bigger it gets, the, uh, the same cost per unit output you have. So the, the, it's not 
that I would disagree <laughs> with the chemical engineering argument that as you increase scale, that it costs come down. And there are certainly very good reasons. Um, it's just not rooted in a physical basis as is often presented. And that's my only point here. So why is scale up a problem? Why do I think it's a problem? Why did I get involved in this area? So this is the, uh, if you could look at now, actually, this is actually the uh, picture of the Shell Pearl plant. It's so big, you can see it from space, right? It is a $32 billion project, probably more now. The interesting thing is that what you find, uh, Rand found actually, they, they looked at mega scale projects, projects over a billion dollars. Guess what, like, go to your boss and you tell them, yeah, I know, I know we said it was gonna be a billion dollars, but actually, it's gonna be two billion. And what they found, actually, in fact, billion dollar scale projects are on average 90% over budget, 90%. That means what was a billion is basically two billion. And why is that? Well, it's not a surprise, right? If you, if, well, I'll give you an example. Sassel II was a gas liquid plant in South Africa. And when they brought Sassel II online, the demand for resources, welders, etc., was so great that they actually only put Sassel I out of business because they couldn't supply all the people they needed to keep it going. So when you do a scale, anything at a billion dollar scale, you distort local economy. All of a sudden, you know, if you're a welder and everybody needs welders, I guess I, I now, my salary is double, right? Supply demand. So, so is that valid for different things too? What's that? The over budget? That is yeah. average so all yeah. capital uh, projects, they were. I think difference would be a lot more bigger. I think. Yeah, I, I for what? Uh, the difference, like F35. Oh, yeah. I think it was supposed to be like 25 million dollars. So this is why big projects are such a problem for innovation. So look, this, this is a plot, I've got to give you a second to digest this. So these are companies that have an annual revenue of 100,000. There are about a million companies in the United States that have a revenue of under 100,000. Okay? These are companies that have a revenue of over 100 billion. Eight. There are eight companies in the whole U.S. that have revenue of 100. Okay, and then there's a difference between the two. If you figure, if you want to finance a $1 billion investment, you probably need to be, have revenues on the order of $100 billion. So who can finance a $100 billion investment? Right, how many of them? Eight, right? If you think about that, that means only eight people can actually innovate in this space. So let's just take an entire continent by contrast, right? That's just the United States companies. How many, how many of these, this is basically a list of GDP of all the countries in Africa, right? How many can afford to build a chemical plant? Six, right? So my, my favorite statistic is Africa, you know, it's 20% of the world's population, 1% of the world's fertilizer. It's no reason they're malnutrition. And why is that? No one can finance an ammonia plant in Africa. They'll pay as much as six times what we do for ammonia. So let's just, uh, this is sort of in the context of, of uh, leading up to the context of why ultimately I realized this was such a huge problem for the government. Let's just do like a thought experiment. And let's just use your standard two-thirds, six-tenths scaling law. And we're gonna say um, that like at scale, we, we're gonna make a gas liquid plant that has uh, a capital cost of $100,000 per daily barrel. That's roughly what people estimated at. And at, uh, at 10,000 barrels per day, or a power plant at one gigawatt at about, uh, 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 one point four or uh, fourteen hundred dollars per kilowatt hour, which is roughly what a gas combined cycle in cost. Okay, <clears throat> then you do you scale it down, right? So what does that mean? That means uh, you guys are in the lab. You're doing an R and D demo. I hope you have forty-seven million dollars for R and D demo, or sixty-five million. And then when you want to do your pilot demonstration, you're talking about 220 million and 300. 
So you're like, ah, well, that's that's not my problem. But it is if you're if you're here in R and D, eventually you're going to want, I would think, technology to be scaled up. So let's put this in the context of the Department of Energy. Remember what I said. Let's go back one. To do a pilot demo, you basically need a couple of hundred million. Okay. Remember that number, a couple of hundred million. Now look at uh, the budget for the Office of Fossil Energy, who does fossil fuel, these kinds of plants. 561 million, 570 million. They can fund two demos a year. Right? This is not, this isn't, and that's the entire budget, right? And it's, this is unsustainable. And if we want to continue to innovate in fields such as energy and, um, and chemical production, then we have to fundamentally change this cost of entry. And this is why ultimately this became sort of a mission of mine. I very much wanted to figure out, like, how do we change this paradigm? Because if we are stuck in this, we cannot <coughs> innovate. Okay, so at the same time as we have this huge challenge for scale up, we actually have these issues like getting power to the rest of the 90% of the world who honestly should have access to cheap energy just as much as we do. So there are challenges which we are not addressing and we do not have the technologies to address. So uh, the developing world, I think I mentioned this. Africa being most notable, uh, the fact that they, they have a bulk of the world's population and yet don't have uh, the fertilizer to grow the food to feed them. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, one is they don't have distributed, they don't have the gigantic you know, factory type farms that we have here. I mean, how, how big is the average farm in the United States? 10,000 acres? It's massive, like not in Africa. You still have small farmers with low purchase power uh, ability. Um, and so as a result, they pay a lot more than we do. OK, I'm from Alaska. So I always have to have something in Alaska in my talks. Uh, uh, this is an interesting place where they put in the geothermal plant. People don't realize uh, yeah, Alaska is a rich pick, uh, state because of oil, and if in many places in, in, in rural Alaska, uh, they'll pay a, a, a dollar a kilo, up to a dollar a kilowatt hour. So think about a dollar a kilowatt hour. That means like probably for you, your average uh, um, monthly um, electric bill will be upwards of uh, 15 to $20,000 per month. So Alaska subsidizes that, but they'll pay the difference between the dollar and 15 cents per kilowatt hour, or five cents, five cents per kilowatt hour, which is like the US average. The problem is that there honestly is no good solution for providing low cost energy to distributed rural communities, right? In this case, they just import diesel and it's very costly. So, okay, biogas, here's another. People like to talk about CO2 emissions but honestly, biological or even natural gas emissions production. But honestly, it's like uh, it's bi biomass by far is a bigger impactor on 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 greenhouse gas emissions because the global warming potential of methane is about twenty five times what CO two is, and most of it is biological. We'd love to be able to use that for something useful. Um, so what if, what if we had a solution to use biological methane? But the problem is, again, it has to be small, right? You don't have a, sort of the large all-in-one-place need for methane that you do, uh, you see, like in a chem big chemical plant. So there's no solution for biology. Um, so this is actually an area that I was working in when I went to the Gas Technology Institute. How many, how many geography buffs? Anyone, anyone, anybody know that city? Something not Dakota. Is it a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a city. It is not a city. Yeah. That light, this is a, at night satellite picture, is from flaring. 
So it's huge, right? This is a, it is a trick question. It turns out the average uh, size of an individual flare is still small. It's on the order, small in terms of energy. It's on the order of about 100 kilowatts, which is pretty tiny. So what is the geographic location of that? It's, this is North Dakota and, and actually part of Canada, the Balkan. And actually, there's a very interesting website. It's called Sky Truth. You can look at it. It's a computer's out. At, at any one time, it does a time lapse of. It has a GIS data. It'll take a time lapse and show you all the flaring worldwide, and you can zoom all the way down to the well where it's being flared. It's pretty awesome. Um, okay, so natural gas flaring. So why don't we solve this problem? Why would we just burn it? The problem is, is that it's small, right? It's so small. It, it, it's just easier to burn it than to build the infrastructure to actually do something useful with it. So this fundamentally is, is the issue. So uh, just kind of summarizing the, the, the problem. Um, first problem with the way we do things now is that this scale that we're at, like the Pearl plant at 32 billion, I don't know if you guys know about this. <coughs> Kind of politically sensitive these days that in Mississippi there's a NGCC plant that's actually funded by DOE. Uh, it's now at 6.5 billion to do clean carbon from coal. Um, I could go a long ways in research, I suppose. Uh, it's still not done, <laughs> but that's the cost of innovation. That's the cost of innovation at the scale in these fields, right? Gas turbines or power production, right? I don't know about you, but I, if we continue, this is clearly a barrier. Like we can't continue to innovate this way. We have to have a different way. The other, the other piece of this problem is that there simply are challenges that are distributed in nature that can't be solved by existing technology. So. You know, whether or not you're talking about biomass, again, biomass, I don't know, how, anybody work in biomass in here? There's two people. So you know that uh, the, the, the cost of bringing the biomass to wherever you're going to process it starts to dominate <coughs> the further you get away, radio, radio. So it means that the solution to process it has to be small. Right? It has to be. Um, and, and, and so you, you see this over and over again, that's full solid waste, right? Like it has to be able to deal with something in a small scale. So, uh, so how do we break, how do we break this head money? I mean, essentially, if you think about it, we have large chemical companies that are the, the Catholic Church of our day, right? They are the industrial incumbents. They, they, they own it. They're not going to change it. It's, it's going to be up to us. So how how do innovators change things that it, it is germane to this? So if you think about Henry Ford, it, in many ways, <laughs> Henry, Henry Ford's biggest innovation was his actually faith that this other learning curve exists. Because Henry Ford knew that if he didn't get the cost below a certain level, the average person couldn't afford it and he couldn't beat the horse. Right? If he didn't get there, then it wouldn't be productive. And so what it meant, that, and that was somewhere around five, six thousand dollars. That meant that he, it wasn't until his ten thousandth car that he started to make any money. Think about how scary that is. You're making ten thousand vehicles, and it's not until your ten thousandth one that you're making money. But this works. This has been shown over and over again, and in, in, in semiconductors, and in almost every industry you look at. We know that the, if we increase the, the unit per unit output, and this is sort of this is somewhat practiced in the chemical industry. Definitely, Exxon Mobil is practicing this more and more regularly. They do they do do modular construction and do mass manufacturing of components, but it is in still in many areas not not believed like the religion of scale up is believed. So this is what's called the experience learning curve. It's a different but equivalent to scale-up. And it requires what we call so modular design. And 
people often argue about what it means to be modular. Um, this, is, this is just a trailer. This is a modular design trailer. What it means is separating out the form and the interfaces in, in a, a discrete way so that they're common. So the, the, the alternative would be an integral design. So integral would be that they share functions. This is more efficient, right? This is a much more efficient design, but this is more manufacturing. The other example would be for computers, just to give you another idea, right? This is, looks like a mess, but this is how computers were actually developed, not like this. Or I'm sure laptops are starting to look like that, but they started here. And that is what I would argue that the chemical industry has to do is go, go modular in order to get down these sort of economies of scale learning curves. So you look at this. This is an oil, oil refinery. And this is kind of, I don't know about you, when I looked this up, it kind of astounded me. Like, how many oil refineries are there in the world? There are only about 700 of them. They process seven terawatts of petroleum. It's awesome, right? And if you were to normalize that on what it costs to produce on a, their capitalized basis, it's about $500 uh, uh, per kilowatt. Now you look at an engine, okay? An engine, honestly, is kind of a mo uh, modern marvel. Like the, if you look at that engine, it's made of like aluminum, steel, some plastic. If you took all the met, all the all the just straight up materials, guess how much more that costs in materials? It's about three times the cost of materials. So you could pay a thousand dollars for a chunk of aluminum, or you could get a Ford F one fifty engine. It's impressive. It's super impressive. Not only do they do that, they, we we make. 250 million of those a year, and they process 1.3 terawatts, and it costs an order of magnitude cheaper than an oil refinery. And I would argue that this is just as complex, right? It's a mini chemical plant. Well, people say, okay, that's bullshit. Sorry. This is this is not a chemical plant. It's not comparable. Well, let's get something that's closer to comparable, right? Let's go. This is this should be the germane to the people. In, in Connecticut, right? A turbine, if you look at a turbine, $1,000 per kilowatt, right? Two, almost two orders of magnitude more. Yeah. And how many of them? Only about 5,000 in the US, right? So, like, there is an economy of scale, and smaller can lead to significant improvements in, in, in uh, cost. I'm not the first one to think of this, it's been around before. This is a very classic business school. Everybody heard the story of the blast furnace and the mini mill? Nobody else. Okay, a couple people. So what happened was uh, somewhere in the in the late '90s, electric art uh, electric art for, uh, industry standard was an integrated blast mill. Right? So large steel furnaces and uh, highly integrated, very efficient, um, but they they produce a lot. Like they were big. Um, you couldn't shut them down. You had to shut them down a couple million dollars to start them up again. Right? Continuous processes. But they, they could produce steel very, very cheap. And then it came, across, came along these small arc melters, right? You could electric arc, steel, produce steel, very low cost. Particularly, you could recycle steel. <coughs> and they came along, and they were more expensive, less efficient, but you could turn them on and off when you wanted. And so the blast, the integrated steel market guys, like, go ahead. You can have that uh, piddly little recycling market. And so they took the recycling market, late 2000. And over, basically, they started getting market share. Eventually, when the market took a downturn and these guys had to shut off, these guys were still operating because they could adjust output to the market demand. And eventually, they ended up taking over the market, even though I would argue they're an inferior technology. So why now? And this is probably, all you guys are, are, are doing research, and you're thinking, well, what, what should I be doing for the future? And I'm, I'm, going, to argue, I'm going to argue that you sh that some of the stuff that you're working on could be applied to this, and I think that, that this long term is a direction that you should keep in the back of your mind, because whether or not you do it or you're a part of it, I believe it will happen. So 
the thing, one of the things that's changed is, is there are, have been technology changes in the last two decades that have really changed the way we do things and will continue to change. First one is additive manufacturing. Does anybody do process intensification, reactor design? Only one guy. Okay. All process intensification, you, you, you try to integrate several processes in a highly efficient manner. Uh, that, I believe, is, is enabled by additive manufacturing because you can make things you could never make before. So at Gas Technology Institute, where I was before, we made a coal gasifier, which we're selling in China. So you, you can blame me for extending the coal problem. That gasifier essentially has a jet nozzle on it that's made by 3D printing. And, and to be honest, the iterations required to get that right um, probably could not have happened without 3D printing. And that is a core capability. And, and without that, and, and that particular gasifier, a typical gasifier for coal, might be uh, on the order of uh, four or five stories high. This is about 10 feet, same capacity. Very impressive reduction in scale, allows modular, right? It's enabled by, by, by this three print. Machine learning and automation. How many machine learning automation people? Not one. Great in this group. This is, this is a breakthrough. You can't do a thousand parallel unit operations if it's not a. Right? If you have to hire a guy for each person, each one, you're done. So this is essential. And then the last is uh, because of the distributed nature, Communications have fundamentally changed, and I believe that the combination of these three things will make uh, modular processing inevitable uh, in the chemical industry for the future. So, uh, I grew, as I said, I grew up in Alaska. I, I used to live next to Nikiski oil refinery, and uh, I used to always look at these columns and wonder, like, why, why are they so big, right? Like, why do we have big columns like this. And you know, actually the answer is very simple, but it may be not obvious. Does anybody know why? Like one word. You can do it from Apple falling on its head. <laughs> Gravity. <clears throat> right? What is the forcing function for separate this is a separator essentially. What is the forcing function for this separator? Gravity, right? But you can get around this. Right? How would you get around gravity? Like you're, you, all you're using is the acceleration of a, a gravity to separate two molecules with different uh, separation methods, right? different rates. How about how about uh, centrifugal force? Like this is classic process intensification. This has been on for a long time. So, so you could use centrifugal force and change g effectively. Right, by two, three, four times, shrinking down. This is actually known as high G with the first uh, product in this space. So I would argue, so the first thing that, that, that modular and process has to overcome is, is, is gravity. The second one, which I find much more difficult to overcome, is adiabatic operation at small scale. This is the tough nut to crack. I would say, though, that this is also where the innovation is, where there can be innovation. So the, uh, this is what's called a Swiss roll heat exchanger. There, this actually is a zoom up. The Swiss roll heat exchanger is about, this particular picture is of one that's about three inches. Uh, it came out of a guy, Paul Ronnie. You guys know him, he's at USC. It's basically 14, 1500 C in the middle, super 80 bat combustion. On the outside, you can hold it, like this big. Why? Because the heat, the way the heat is being integrated, right? If you think, if you look at the through radial plane heat transfer, it's really low, right? Because there's heat exchange. It's basically, it's just, it really is like the pastry. The inside and the outside are rolled up together. So this is something where you can get very near adiabatic operation in, in a very small scale. Um, again, uh, an example of innovation um, that I think that could be potentially transferred to solve some of the issues that you'll need to solve for, for modular uh, chemical production. And of course, this is something that is definitely enabled by additive manufacturing. 
So what will be the impact? If, if, we can, if we can do this, if we can make modular chemical production, you know, how does the world change? And this is just sort of wrapping it up. And then I, I'll probably break for questions as, as timing-wise as we So, you know, you, you think we have, over history, we've seen revolutions happen. We've seen uh, monarchies fall, industrial incumbents fall over and over again. And I, I would argue to you that this really is, is, is the next one. It will happen. It is happening. The question for me and for our country is that how do we do it? Uh, how do we own it? How do we lead it? Because it will happen. So just finishing, um, this you know this is the world today in chemical production. This picture captures it. We have a total inability to deliver um, chemicals and, for that matter, uh, power to the average person. And and yet other technologies have managed to do it. So all you chemical engineers, you're slacking off, right? We, we can, we can, we should be able to deliver a four atom molecule to Isaac here, so he can fertilize this farm. And the fact that we can't is honestly the challenge for this next generation. Right? We should be able to. And I guess with that, I'm going to switch to uh, taking questions. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. How about ten minutes for convers uh, questions, and then I'll, I want to spend five minutes talking about cyclotron rotor. Okay. Very good. That's good. Uh, or five and five. So you've been making those uh, cell phones or those devices. You do need a big plant to do that, like five billion dollars in terms spending. You do now. Yeah. But that's after a consolidation of an industry. Right. So why is it different from chemical things? So do you also need big plants to produce whatever you need to produce. So. That, that's a good point, right? Yeah. What, in, a, in a sense, what you're, you're transferring the capital risk to the plant of making the units versus... So but the, the difference is that the, how, how you get down that cost curve is not my, making the plants successively bigger. It's by getting your supply chain more efficient, right? So it, it, it's true. That, that, that's a good point. But the, but, the, but the product has changed, right? So the plant, the product was the chemical. Now uh, what I'm saying is the product is the plant. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a different, different way. Um, I'm curious to see your opinion um, on the aspect of safety. A lot of these chemicals you're talking about may be modular or pretty yeah. dangerous. If ammonia leaks out, it's going to kill, mm -hmm. you know, it, may, it has the potential to kill a lot of people around it. What, what do you foresee? Um, how, how does that issue get addressed? Uh, you know, people brought that to me before, and frankly, you're not the first person. And uh, I mean, if you look at GE, you know, they make chloroalkali plants, and they actually make them modular. They used to make them large scale, and after a major disaster, I forget where it was, it was back east here, quite a few people died. They, they actually went to modular for exactly the opposite reason. Because of the fact that you can control the safety side better. Do you think uh, President Trump is right in calling the RBE? So okay, so this is my understanding. Um, I, I think it's a political bargaining chip, personally. I I think that there is bipartisan support for RBE. I think that there are supporters on both sides. I mean, at the end, as a we're scientists, I, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Democrat. I just tell you, like, I, I, I never have been. Uh, I, and you know, I grew up in Alaska, I'm from a red state. So. But, but uh, you know, I think no one knows what's going on right now. Obviously. No, not even the people that should. And this is being recorded, so I think that's a sufficient. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that, that's as far as far as I would go, right? Like, I I think it'll be fine. I think that. Do I agree with it? I think he doesn't understand yet what they do, like a lot of other things. Okay, I'll change the topic a little bit. 
for your time of energy production, how about like a semiconductors? So do, do you think it's a kind of democratizing this semiconductor? That's a really interesting question, because actually semiconductors were, went, became democratized when every company in the world could afford to make a semiconductor uh, fab, a could buy a lithographic tool. So the lithography tools at uh, 20 nanometers were about uh, 100 million. And now they're up, if you want to go to 14, you need basically over 500 to, to 700 million. So uh, th there is a consolidation of the industry because of the cost of the tubing. This goes back to your manufacturing. So on, on the on the semiconductor itself, that's clearly democratized. The tooling, though, is actually going away from that. Um, but I think the industry has been democratized once. I think that once they figure out how to drive the cost down, that it will go back to being distributed. I mean, let me give you another example. I have a friend. He actually uh, Rudy Ray's one. He's got a plant in Missouri. Uh, he uh, he is the world supplier of can manufacturing. The world supplier, like you have a can manufacturing plant in Africa. This goes to your question of like build the chemical plant or build the can or make the chemical. Mm -hmm. He actually makes the plant for cans, right? And he didn't own the industry for a long time, but he now basically is the world supplier. And the reason he's able to beat anyone else is that he does. It's not exactly modular because it's what's called stick build. It's it's modular in design. So he has the same design, he, does, he makes it in shipping crates that are exactly all the same size. And you want to put it in Africa, I'll ship it there. And then he puts it all together, and it's always the same. And no one can touch him anymore on cost because he's come down the curve. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, since, uh, as far as we know, that China is good at the cost down. So can China play a role in this field to make the things to be cheap or something like that? I mean, everyone can. Why? Can China play a role? Yeah. I, I For mean, sure. You know, I guess, you know, the thing is that, in, interestingly, China is one of the few places, like, they are still investing in big, big stuff, right? But ironically, their, their strategic advantage is in the modular, right? Like, their ability to manufacture at low cost will give them a strategic advantage, which is why I think the United States should take this seriously. Like, if they start to get down a cost curve... So whoever gets in and gets down the curve first wins, right? That's the, that's the champ. That's what's at risk here. Um, and China certainly has the capabilities to do that. Um, they haven't. Uh, they they're putting in large power plants, but uh, I certainly think they could if they wanted to. Um, more questions? Get yeah, ahead. Cool. So what's the? <coughs> I think you're missing the big gap. The big gun. A big, big gap. Why this is not happening? So, how about people? How yeah, you're right. But well, not, 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 not um, intentionally, because if I understood, uh, then I would be trying to solve it. No, no. So, if we <laughs> ask these people, the people yeah. that leave the university, higher education, whatsoever, you go open your new, innovative, small turbine company or work with United Technologies? What's the answer? Yes. Just what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not it's either. I don't, I don't consider that either or. I consider that, in fact, the optimum solution is working with both, right? You start the small company so that you have the autonomy to grow and you work with United Technologies potentially as an acquisition partner uh, I think that it doesn't have to be either or. I, th I think that that actually is the, the solution. Okay, well, let's take another example of um, democratization. Um, how many people know who George Mitchell is? Probably no one. Main senator? Not George Mitchell. Uh -huh. no. The father of hydraulic fracturing. Oh. You know, like if you talk to anybody on the industry, they're going to say, what's the biggest thing that happened in the last two decades? And they would say, shale gas revolution. Like, there is no doubt that, like, from a pure dollar, that was a trillion dollar change in this economy. Mm -hmm. George Mitchell pioneered low cost hydraulic. Hydraulic fraction has been around all for a long time, but with actually government funding, uh, Gas Technology Institute also funded George Mitchell in, in Texas to develop the first uh, 
low-cost hydraulic fractures. And in addition to that, it was two things. One, initial R&D funding. Um, oh, so I'm getting back to your thing, which is uh, George Mitchell was an entrepreneur. He was happy to work with large companies, but the fact is the shale gas revolution didn't happen at Exxon, didn't happen at Chevron, none of the majors, right? Like even today, the people that are still pioneering in the field in West Texas are small operators. And so I would say the startup company is essential. Probably they need money from the big companies. And I don't think that, that those are like two things have to be mutually exclusive. But your bigger question about how do you get there and why aren't people doing it, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, so I, I had worked on this trying to get an initiative off the ground in this area. I eventually abandoned it after a couple of years um, for a number of reasons. One, the politics were too, too complicated uh, dif and difficult. I had worked uh, in DC trying to get funding to push an initiative through on this. Um, cor corporate, there was corporate interest, but there wasn't corporate. Uh, there's a difference between kicking tires and, and an actual strategic investment towards it. And the, the reality is a single corporation even can't do this because it needs coordination. They, they need, they'll need to collaborate with other big corporations, right? In the end, any modular thing has, you have to agree on some standard. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to own the IP around that. That's ultimately where I kind of gave up, gave up uh, that and the political side. I was like, getting companies to agree to have an open standard is very difficult. Right, that's what happened to computers. That's the reason why PCs came up. Right? That's right. So standardization is the key. It is key. It, that, that's that's right. But you know, it's it's also really tough. So I want to take. Uh, you know, I I left uh, this doing this initiative, and I just want to share because this actually should be could be of direct interest to you. Um, I now work for what's called uh, Cyclotron Road, and essentially it's sort of an incubator. Um, I gave this. Uh, Elsewhere, but I just this is a, my own plug, but it's also a plug for you. How many people are graduating in the next three years with a PhD? How many people are going to want to start a company? Maybe. So basically, what we do is where we it's sort of a mentorship fellowship program for people who want to do translational technology development. You know, when I was at DOE, it became clear to me like the best investment for our dollars was in small companies. <laughs> but I was seeing all the innovators just getting beat up by investors. So basically what we do is we say, okay, you're a smart guy, we like your technology concept, come to Berkeley Lab for uh, two years, we'll pay your salary, and even if you come with two, two people, we'll pay both people. You form a company, that company keeps all the intellectual property that's gonna be developed while at Berkeley Lab. We'll give you access to lab resources so you can develop your technology. So in my case, I had a startup company. I raised $4 million before I even figured out whether or not there's a business there. Right? That's what you have to do in a normal scenario in hardware-based technology. So in this case, we give you access to enough resources that you can get started um, and without having to uh, raise a bunch of money. And, and honestly, you get down a scenario, which it's very hard to see. Just skip through this stuff. Um, so Basically, we recruit people. We do competition in September. Uh, last year, we had about 150 people apply. We typically take about six to ten or six to nine teams, uh, and generally in the energy space, like we're funded by the Department of Energy, Advanced Manufacturing Office. We give you a salary. It's actually 80% salary, so roughly $85,000 a year uh, stipend plus travel expense relocation expense and health insurance. So we cover that so you don't have to worry about it. We plug you in and uh, pair you up with somebody at the lab so you have access to lab resources. And we give you a whole lot of mentorship. And for us, uh, we're very interested and in we, after two years, you go out into the world, right? So we, we try to get you venture capital. So our first six teams uh, just finished. They raised now coming out 17 million. They had about 10 in uh, public money and about seven in private sector funding. So not too bad, um, but the whole point is to kind of help you. 
We're not like a typical incubator, which is that like 50 companies a year. We're small, high touch. We're specifically for open for technologists. If you have a PhD degree, if you have an MBA, I, um, we're not for the MBAs. We're for technologists who want to develop technology. So and where is your payoff? What's that? Where is your payoff? Where is your return? You're just doing it for, for innovation. The goodness or? of my heart. I know you can't believe that. No one does that anymore. How could that be? I, 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 I believe in this. I, honestly, when I was, George and I were talking earlier, I, I wanted to go be faculty at one point. And uh, I was at MIT doing liquid metal battery stuff. And I, I just realized, like, all those grad students I was working with, they had a heck of a time. They're like you when they get out. The job market is not good. I just have forewarned you guys. Despite what they say in the media, they don't want you. <laughs> I, 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 not to be negative to you, but that's, that's the truth. Mm, right? not like, what it's, with our what's that? They're not what we are saying with our students. It's this year. Oh, maybe <laughs> this year it's different. Yeah. It, it's not what people have imagined. You spend all this time getting educated, and then, like, you feel like I mean, the, the market's going to come in something. That they're like. finding through our websites, and all the students are. It's not that there aren't jobs, right? But in your field, uh, it's it's pretty hard. It's tough. Like, I, I'm, it, I mean, the whole reason we started this. So, of these companies that just finished, uh, they now employ thirty, a little over thirty people. Uh, Twenty-two of those are PhDs. So like we are creating jobs for demand for PhDs. The highest value, think of the market demand for a doctorate is that time, like an early stage of a company where there's still a lot of technical uncertainty. You know, all that you learn actually has really a lot of value. Um, a big, you know, I, when I was at MIT, a Sloan student did this graph for me. You know, the, the x-axis was time and the y-axis was company value. And I had the PhD like this. I had the MBA like this. And it kind of pissed me off. And I, I thought, this is bullshit. Uh, but, then, but then, you know, I realized he's right, right? Like, you don't need to be super technical to run one of those things. You need great, great smoothing skills. You need to be a politician. You need to run HR, right? You don't, you don't need to be deep te technically. So the, for me, this was, like, in, in a sense, uh, you know, we had a chance when I was at Department of Energy with Secretary Chu. Like, I had a lot of good interaction with him. And being kind of the punk that I am, he, he would come to RPE and ask each of us, like, what's your program? Why are you running it? Kind of give us a third degree. It was pretty cool. Like, and I was like, that's fine, Mr. Secretary, but, like, why are, why are you here? <laughs> and he's like, that's a very fair question. And he's like, in my entire career, like, there's nothing that parallel with Bell Labs. And there's nothing that exists like it anymore. And he's like, I want to take a lot of shots on goal experimentally, organizationally, with Department of Energy, to try to recreate something as impactful as Bell Labs. And honestly, I, I, thought, I think that, that that is a worthy goal. It, in many levels, we're taking another shot on goal to try to create an environment where technologies can do translational technology development in a way that's like a rewarding career. So anyway, if you're interested, this is what we do. This is what I do now. Um, I, there's nothing in it for me except for that, you know, I, I, I do get paid to do this. Uh, but I, it's a fundamental belief. I believe in science. I believe in research. And I believe that for the success of our, our field and our endeavors, that we must continue to convince the market that we generate value for it. And this is a way we can do both. Any questions about that? Yeah. Oh. I'm just wondering uh, what kind of uh, what kind of technologies uh, are needed to create those models you mentioned? This or modular? Modular. Um, so low cost separation technology is one. I mean, in the end, anything that you can do at a smaller scale, right, like it is a big deal. Like uh, what errors, like uh, automation or? Automation is definitely one. So, okay, so one of the big issues in distributed uh, automation is the ability to be extremely robust. I mean, uh, in a way that I think despite uh, the existing automation, 
doesn't have a fail safe that it, going back to the, the safety thing, um, if you're going to put something out in the middle of nowhere with no one watching it, it, it needs to be super, super robust. So like, I think that there are another level of control systems that still needs to be overcome. So I have more of a case study-esque question. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned about the difficulty in standardizing and um, companies collaborating. And there's one really strong example of, I mean, I guess that happening in the industry, and that's the Tesla charger and battery technologies that uses IP. I was wondering if you could give me Tesla a charger. Yeah. Because they released that charging technology. Yeah, for that, that reason, right? Um, so there, there, there are industry, are, are you guys familiar with the HART protocol for communications and industrial systems? So there are examples when industrial companies have gotten together and, and, and set up on a standard, but not in a global sense. I'm, so Tesla is unique. Is, yeah, they're so unique. They're such an outlier in many, in many ways that it, it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to compare them with existing industries. I think we have. We need to enter the room. I think okay. we're waiting for the class right after. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.